Hello, welcome to this installment of Melendi Avenue Review on video. I know I don't really do a lot of videos lately. Maybe I'll go back to them, maybe I won't. Um, I don't have a ton of ideas. Uh, but, you know, if you are interested in my content, you should probably just look at my newsletter because that's where I post most of my things. It's free, um, so if you want my book reviews and whatnot, um, you can also pay me some money for various benefits you might or might not want. Uh, but I do like to record my birthday lectures. This one was a somewhat unusual one. I think I really took on too big of a topic. Uh, I didn't finish it really in time for my birthday. I had to uh, deliver kind of a like notes version, which I semi-improvised, which some people liked and some people didn't. Um, so, you know, uh, but I figured I'd, you know, have this version of it here, you know, for posterity and for a few people who said they wanted to have it on video. So this is my 2022 birthday lecture, Notes Towards an Intellectual History of Generation X. Part one, generational history, vernacular history. There are generations for which it would be possible to write a fairly straightforward, standard, elite intellectual history. Prior to the watershed of the First World War, commentators restricted the concept of generation as a coherent unit of analysis to the articulate portion of the population, the ones who left written records, that is, to elites, the usual actors in intellectual history. These generations often took the form of people who were a given age for a specific bounded historical event. Take the generation of 98, a generation of Spanish intellectuals that came of age around the same year that the United States seized most of the remnants of Spain's overseas empire. The term mostly refers to intellectuals, writers, and philosophers like Miguel de Unamuno, Antonio Machado, and Ramon del Valle Inclán. The term generation here makes little reference to the mass of the Sp Spanish population born and living at the same time and never was meant to. Such an approach will not do for Generation X. This is not because Generation X lacks intellectuals. It has the same complement of them any generation has, and some fairly good ones, too. There's a number of fine historians in that age cohort, I know. The approach won't do because of changes in what we mean when we talk about generations. These, in turn, reflect and were determined by changes in the larger spheres of cultural life. For this reason, for others, we must turn to what I call vernacular history of ideas, or vernacular intellectual history, if you're going to start to get a grip on what Generation X means. I have toyed with other terms for it, usually swapping out words like popular, demotic, extracurricular, extramural, as in outside of the walls of the academy, but I think vernacular works best. For centuries, depending on the part of the world in question, vernacular language, the types of language spoken in homes, fields, and markets, was generally not the language of serious, engaged thought. Sacred languages, learned mostly by elites and special castes, seldom used for quotidian business or personal life, Latin, Greek, Slavonic among Christians, Pali in the Buddhist world, Sanskrit in India, pre-Zionist revival Hebrew among Jews, specialized forms of Arabic and Chinese, were the language of scholars. There were some times and places of intellectual ferment in the pre-modern world where the vernacular language was also the language of scholarship. Plato's Greek would not have been that different from the Greek spoken by most Athenians, or the Arabic of many of the great thinkers of the flowering of Islamic philosophy from the people in the bazaar. But the assumption that scholars will speak and work in the same language as their host society was not one anyone could make prior to a few recent centuries. It wasn't just snobbery that led to this division within languages. Scholars believed that the linguistic qualities of vernacular language suited those languages to vernacular purposes, and that the languages they used in their scholarly doings were suited to the proper subject of scholarship, which they understood to be the divine and the eternal. Sacred languages had specialized vocabulary and grammatical structures that seemed more suited to discuss abstract ideas and unchanging verities in a rigorous fashion. Often enough, people believed these languages to be the tongue with which God himself spoke to humanity. Vernacular languages, on the other hand, were the language of the contingent, the chance-based, the slippery, labile, unrigorous, of the restless motion that Thomas Brown observed in the nematodes and gnatworms. I would put it to the reader that most intellectual history discusses, as it were, intellectual history in the register of the sacred scholarly languages of old. 
This is true even when a given work of intellectual history exclusively concerns itself with intellectual artifacts written in vernacular languages, that is, almost all of modern intellectual history. Now that the sacred slash vernacular writing distinction is mostly collapsed. Most intellectual history, that is, concerns itself with ideas produced by professional producers of ideas. These are often academics, but even when the subjects never held an academic position, they are usually the producers of intellectual material that academics would read as part of their work. Well-regarded literary artifacts, serious philosophy, so on and so on. These works, both the mainstream of intellectual history and the works they draw from and analyze, tend to ask questions about the sort of issues that once would have been deemed appropriate to the sacred languages, and usually take approaches that reflect that orientation. They grapple with ideas that seek to illuminate high-level problems, whose authors intend them to last the test of time, to be applicable outside of the welter of context and contingency. Even where determinedly secular is in the history of, say, post-Cartesian science or post-Marx leftist movements, the orientation towards the eternal, towards something that points towards an order that transcends the mundane and the quotidian, lingers in intellectual history. As it happens, the intellectual history of ideas produced by people we could call vernacular, that is, people who produce ideas but whose primary social role is not to produce ideas, often deals with the same transcendent topics, life and death, good and evil, morality, metaphysics, the right ordering of societies, as the most determinedly sacred philosophers. Arguably, contemporary vernacular thought is more concerned with the sacred than academic thought is these days. But I would still put it to you that even the religious speculations of the five percenters, the metaphysics of the New Age or darker QAnon, and the thoroughgoing, whatever else you'd call it, Political theory of the sovereign citizen movement can still be called vernacular in this vernacular sacred dichotomy that I am using. Even where the thinker in question takes a transcendent as a subject matter, it still usually uses more of the approach of the vernacular. It speaks vernacular language, thinks vernacular thoughts, applies vernacular operations to its subject, not always exclusively but reliably. Especially given the collapse of the sacred vernacular distinction between different languages and the rise of mass education that this collapse helped enable, concepts and vocabulary from the academic realm find their way into vernacular thinking and vice versa. That said, the walls of the academy make for a decent rough and ready demarcation point for our purposes. Vernacular thought does not belong strictly to the poor downtrodden, nor does academic or sacred thought belong strictly to the elite. The records most billionaires choose to leave of their thoughts would be the subject of vernacular intellectual history, even if they mix in half-remembered lessons from the colleges they dropped out of. The grad student who served you your coffee today has likely written work that would fit in well with the traditional academic intellectual history. To be absolutely clear, I do not subscribe to any model that purports that the contemporary academy can easily be slotted into the role that the Catholic Church or other religious institutions did in times and places where their political and cultural power waxed, and certainly do not mean to suggest that vernacular literature is, always and everywhere, populist, subversive, or anything other than linguistically and structurally inclined towards a contingent and contextual. I also do not see one tradition as superior to the other. I do tend to find the study of vernacular thought a little more interesting and more of a challenge in the historiographical sense. Let me propose a literary metaphor. Most intellectual history, almost all of it, in the sacred-slash-academic mode, resembles in subjects and structure canonical literature. Some intellectual history recapitulates the literary theme of the quest, extended efforts to overcome difficulties to attain some goal. Others resemble the classic bourgeois novel of marriage and inheritance, with its overwhelming concern for reconciling feeling with legitimacy. Still others, like concept histories, echo modernist or postmodernist explorations of form and medium. Perhaps this is vain, but I think a worthwhile vernacular intellectual history more closely resembles genre fiction. And in particular, the two forms of genre fiction that most reliably mount a challenge, both their readerships into literature and society in general, science fiction and crime fiction. From science fiction, vernacular intellectual history can draw countless examples of how to understand and depict strange worlds, and a century of experiments in the art of making the familiar strange and vice versa. From con 
From crime fiction, we could take the methodology of both characters and authors, the use of manifold, in some cases specialized, unpredictable, or improvised tools and techniques to illuminate obscurity, who is a killer, or pry open what has been denied to us. How are we going to get those jewels? This could just be my own taste, but many of the best mixtures of sci-fi and crime came about in times fruitful for the study of vernacular ideas. Bester's The Demolished Man, as the McCarthyite freeze began to thaw, but before hype overtook the 60s, in Philip K. Dick's Ubik, as the era spiraled out of anyone's control, Gibson's Neuromancer at the gloaming period that wasn't quite the Cold War and wasn't quite the end of history, the works of writers like Madeleine Ashby, Paolo Bacigalupi, and Aize Jama Everett in our own confusing time. It feels right somehow. Part 2. Structure of Feeling Intellectual history as a subfield has its giants, lineages, debates, such as the one about whether we ought to call it intellectual history or the history of ideas, and so on. Vernacular intellectual history doesn't really exist as a sub or sub-subfield with all these accoutrements, so we try to collect our own forebears catch as catch can. One I would name is the great Welsh critic, novelist, and historian Raymond Williams. Raymond Williams belonged to a group of brilliant British Marxist historians in the mid-20th century, E.P. Thompson, Eric Hobsbawm, Christopher Hill, and so on. Unlike these luminaries, Williams came from a working-class background. He grew up in rural Wales, the son of a railroad worker, and he spent almost as much time working in adult education as he did teaching at Cambridge. Perhaps this has something to do with Williams' abiding interest in acquiring a synoptic view of cultural moments in history, understanding how all of the relevant parts of a culture at a given time operated to create a coherent whole, very much including what we would call popular, or even vernacular, culture. Williams was one of the first people to open up popular culture as a field of sustained academic study. One of the terms he created to describe what he studied was structures of feeling. This phrase has made its way into general discourse in some places, generally in vague and unhelpful ways. You can see why the phrase might loan itself to vagueness. How do you make a structure out of feeling? I think it's important to think of the structure of feeling less like a physical structure and more like a medium of communication, not the structure of a barn, but the structure of a TV network. The structure of feeling is all of the infrastructure, ranging from widely held societal values to artistic works, to the actual physical infrastructure of communication and its influence on how ideas are communicated, that allow for some things to be communicated in a broader community in a given time and place, and which render other things impossible to communicate. The structure of feeling is the way historical conditions express themselves in a given cultural period and vice versa. Two things are worth noting here. First, in his 1961 work, The Long Revolution, Raymond Williams, when introducing the concept of structures of feeling, specifically cited generations as examples, arguably the paradigmatic example of a structure of feeling, a mean, means of communicating values and ideas that shift with the times and that are not formally established or even consciously learned. The next is that Williams stood at a cusp of sorts in how generations were understood. The aforementioned elite idea of generations is being made up of those who went to universities, or were at least university-aged, together at a given time when such distinctions were only for the elite, eventually gave way to a more broad-based idea of what a generation was, inspired by such society-wide common experiences for given age groups as world wars and global depressions. So, the works of Raymond Williams should provide a model for studying generations, Generation X included, right? Well, yes and no. Williams is certainly a model in terms of breadth of scope, sensitivity and thoughtfulness of analysis, and the interweaving of the cultural and the material. But I think it is something of a weakness of his generation of Marxist scholars that they essentially try to turn the vernacular into something like the sacred. Think of E.P. Thompson's line about rescuing the history of the English working class from the enormous condescension of history. It's hard to overstate the importance of the project of social historians like Thompson, Williams, and the others in their cohort mounted to explore the lives of common people in history. But they did this in large part because of an ennobling instinct. As Marxists, they believe the working people are the protagonists of history. Arguably, they had the highest, one might say most sacred, goals of any historians of their century.
Raymond Williams, in particular, sought to embed all meaningful culture into a communicative framework, where the communicants, the framework itself, and Williams himself in explicating this framework were all elevating the practice of communication, the basis of all organized life, starting from the cellular and on to whole human civilizations, to greater and greater heights. As a Marxist and as a man dedicated to the working class from which he came, he believed that these heights were only attainable if the people as a whole participated in this ever-scaling journey up the heights towards perfect communication and comprehension, hence his efforts to wrest intellectual history towards a broader base outside of the academy. It's not so much that I disagree with any of this, though many of my main disagreements with Marxism are of the teleological variety, so much as I'm intrigued by the possibilities of other approaches. At the heart of my approach to vernacular history lies this supposition, that miscommunication is as important, as critical to the making of culture, if not more, than communication. Every medium of communication which Williams treats as, if not solely existing for the purpose of communicating truth, then mainly existing for the communication of sincerely meant ideas, is also a medium for misprision. Any medium for communicating truth is also a media, medium for propagating falsehoods, intentional or unintentional, simple or plain, sorry, elaborate or plain, aimed towards a wide variety of others or towards the self, or simply yopped into the universe. In short, we need to take the lesson of the internet, the supposedly neutral and free communication forum of fora that turned into, well, the internet, to Williams' concept of the structure of feeling. Raymond Williams specifically cited generations as examples of structures of feeling, the kind of structure that allowed for some communications to have a kind of meaning and impact within the structure that the same communication could not have outside of it. He discusses generations both in the elite sense, generations of writers, scholars, other opinion-forming types, and in the then ascending mass sense, the idea that being born in a specific time unites everyone born in said time, not just the people who went to school together. Among other things, self-conscious generational definition was ramping up to a fever pitch as a baby boom generation approached adulthood simultaneously with Williams' work in the area. Between Williams' own blessings and the ways in which we have all seen generational discourse be used for obfuscation, bullshit, salesmanship, ideology, and simple cretinism, I think looking at generations as structures of feeling is as good a place as any to introduce some of the muck of misprision into the gleaming palace of communication that Williams sometimes wrote as though structures of feeling are. Part 3, Some Basic Lineaments of the Case of Generation X Let's start with a basic premise, then, that will root the generational structure a feeling where it belongs in the fertile muck of misprision. Despite being notionally based in time of birth, generations are not born, they are made. Yes, there is such a thing as shared experience based on being a certain age for certain events or phenomena. But as the case of Generation X will demonstrate, the concepts of generations that are promulgated by writers, artists, and thinkers invariably create major exclusions within their age cohorts. As such, it joins numerous other identity categories of dubious origin, such as race and nationality, but lacks the gravitas of history, or millions dead as the case may be, behind it that those two categories have. Much like with race, nationality, religion, and so on, it is a belief in the concept that people have come to invest in the idea of generation that gives some weight to the category, not what few intrinsic merits it has. Here's a way to get across the artifice of generational identity using Generation X, our sometimes missing subject. Where were the black people? Think of any of the cultural touchstones of Generation X and what you see is blindingly white. Then consider that the cultural ascendance of Generation X also saw some of the most important black cultural accomplishments of the 20th century, including the epical musical change that was the birth of hip-hop. If anything, Generation X, understood as a cultural artifact and a structure of feeling, is considerably whiter than the baby boom generation, whose cultural and political trajectory is unimaginable without the influence of civil rights and black power, as well as of soul and R&B music. This is remarkable when considering that by population, Generation X was considerably less white than their baby boom forebears and saw things like the aforementioned rise of hip-hop, the career of Michael Jackson, 
several substantial black uprisings like that in South Central LA in 1992, arguably the first serious black presidential campaign mounted by Jesse Jackson, and that the first and so far only U.S. president elected from Generation X was Barack Obama. Here's another. Who are the definitional writers of any given generation? Writers only yield to musicians and possibly filmmakers as the creators of definitional imagery for any given generation. Given that writers usually come to prominence at a later part of their life than musicians do, it's not too unusual that many generational, generation-defining writers are, in fact, older than the generation they supposedly define. But consider what Generation X literature would look like without William S. Burroughs, born in 1947, Kathy Acker, also born in 1947, Charles Bukowski, born 1920, Tom Robbins, born 1932, William Gibson, born 1949, Bruce Sterling, born 1954. The situation is even starker with the baby boom generation. Quick, think baby boomer writers. The names come quick and fast. Philip Roth, Norman Mailer, Joan Didion, Hunter S. Thompson, Marilyn French, Kurt Vonnegut, Jack Kerouac. Definers of literary modes and attitudes we associate with the baby boom generation, all of them. And born in 1933, 1923, 1934, 1937, 1929, 1922, and 1922 again, respectively. That's not even getting into the racial dimension. Why such major black writers from the generational cohort, born between 1960 and 1980, as Zadie Smith, Colson Whitehead, Jessamyn Ward, and who knows who else, aren't considered Gen X writers in the same way as Brett Easton Ellis, Donna Tartt, and Jonathan Lethem. The latter three, not only all being white, but literally all having belonged to the same freshman class at Bennington College. Lastly, on the definitional space, even leaving aside the question of how sensible it is to group people by birth cohort this way, who decides on the size of the cohort? In my conversations with people about this topic, almost all of them understood generations as encompassing everyone born within a given 15 to 20 year span. Like other aspects of generational identity, the holes are obvious when you think about it, and the provenance of this common sense is a lot closer in time than you might think. If the logic of generations is that of shared experience, of being a given age for a given event, then there's nothing obvious about arguing that, to take one example drawn from Gen X, the early sexual experiences of someone born in 1965, coming of age in the midst of the AIDS epidemic, and someone born in 1979, coming to the same age as AIDS treatments become available, at least to those with means and access, and in any event, AIDS ceased to be seen as a looming media phantom, would be at all similar. You can extend that to numerous other generational touchstones, and a millennial reader probably doesn't need to be reminded of the gap of experience between people born in 1984 versus, say, 1996. Assigning generational labels to ever larger age cohorts seems, from what I can tell, to be an artifact of efforts on the part of vaguely social scientific scribblers to create a coherent historical theory of generations. This actually coincided with what would become the defining of Generation X as a body with a discourse around it. In most cases, any given generational discourse starts with previous generations trying to define those who came after. For all this, is supposed to be a lecture about Generation X, much of the stories about people from earlier generations, mostly people who are baby boomers and who embraced what that generational self-definition is supposed to mean, crafting a discourse about them, attempting to define and give meaning to the experience of a cohort over whom they had some degree of power. And boy howdy, you will not run into too many boomers more boomerish than William Strauss and Neil Howe. That's not just me being hypocritical and using the generational lens I decry but cannot entirely avoid, they'll tell you that themselves. Both dabbled in the student movement, if I understand the biographical snippets they include, before becoming Capitol Hill types, staffers turned consultants turned pundits. Howe affected a seriousness before his death in 2007. Strauss, who is still with us, was one of the founders of the Capitol Steps, the political musical comedy troupe made up of Capitol staffers, who come up with dog roll songs about the electoral doings of the day and travel the land performing them for audiences. The pair are best known for the Strauss-Howe generational theory, first propagated in their massive doorstop book called, boringly enough, Generations, published in 1991. It's become a commonplace to compare dubious ideas to astrology. 
but I'm not the first to make that comparison between the Strauss-Howe theory and the horoscope pages. Not only do Strauss and Howe purport to define all 13 generations, supposedly, that have passed since the first English settlers came to America, but they insist that all generations follow a four-slot pattern. Generations of heroes are followed by generations of artists, then by prophets and nomads, before the cycle goes back up to heroes again, each cohort about 20 years in length. Strauss and Howe might not have invented the concept of long generations, but they certainly did a lot to popularize it. Much like the lecture where I discussed traditionalists, like Julius Evla, actually explaining what Strauss and Howe meant, by all this would take too long and is too stupid to really belabor. And unlike Evla, Strauss, Howe, and their beliefs are boring. The capital steps thing is the funniest thing about them. There's these special conjunctions of epicycles and combinations of which sort of generations are when in their life cycle with whatever other generations that are supposed to have significance. This is where Strauss and Howe's many friends in high places come into the narrative. When the book was published, Strauss's main project was writing little ditties about the deficit. Howe's main project was working with Peter Peterson on selling deficit hawk politics and pushing entitlement privatization as a solution. Peterson wasn't alone. There, there was a genuinely bipartisan enthusiasm for Strauss and Howe's ideas in the early 90s, with many copies of the paperback exclaiming how Generations was a book Al Gore and Newt Gingrich could agree on. It became a truism that the generation of nomads that Strauss and Howe identified coming of age as they wrote, that is, Gen X, would be the ones to impose their austere practical values on the bold but impracticable moralistic schema of their prophet baby boomer elders, and finally privatize social security and force through something like a balanced budget constitutional amendment. The early Baffler magazine, led by Tom Frank and Rick Perlstein, cut their teeth savaging the cultural flack thrown up by obvious political grifters pursuing this end, the numerous tergiversations they employed as they simultaneously midwifed and exploited new tropes for their generation. Gen Xers, as they came to be known around this time, having grown up in the scary, unstable 70s, craved solidity and so simply could not believe that Social Security could remain solvent. Gen Xers were individualists and risk-takers who were disinclined to the stultifying stability of company man life that PR Flax managed to mimetically associate with adequate pay and benefits the welfare state and unions around this time. Many of these concepts found their way into the hype for the first internet bubble and the rise of techno-libertarianism in the 1990s more generally. The feeling put abroad was that something was changing, and even if we weren't clear on what that something was and how it was changing, people were assured by business writers and glossy magazine con contributors that the only proper reaction to these changes was slashing the welfare state and piling more money and power at the feet of the rich. This was the period where Tom Friedman came to prominence, which says most of what needs to be said. As is the case with a lot of neoliberal dreams 30 years later, the only ones so enthusiastic for Strauss and Howe's esoterica, if for many of these early ideas associated with Gen X identity, are now fascists. Steve Bannon, a man who has dabbled in numerous vaguely occult ideas, had at one point triangulated from the turnings of the Strauss-Howe theory that the coming of the millennial generation would signal the rise of his kind of nationalist reactionary politics, and that the election of Trump to the presidency was proof of this. This concerns a generation of heroes that supposedly, inevitably, follows nomads, that is, we millennials. This comes up in the recent play Heroes of the Fourth Turning by Will Arbery, which is about millennial trad calf intellectuals making each other miserable as they prepare to be these heroes. For anyone keeping score, given that Gen Z has also been called by some a uniquely conservative generation, this is three generations in a row that pundits have attempted to say would make America great again. Arguably, convincing anyone at all of this is not the baby boomer's least trick, given that the single biggest demographic behind the Trump movement was... Dot, dot, dot. It's a mistake to think that any of these men, Republican, Democrat, notionally independent pedants like Peterson or fascist goons like Bannon really let Strauss and Howe or any other writer or thinker dictate plans to them or act as a guidebook. That's something that people who write about the intellectual influences of politicians and other non-academic figures often flub. They often seize upon a given thinker as a singular guide to a given politician's ideas and behavior, treating them not unlike a rather unflattering portrait 
of how Marxists supposedly treat Marx. From my own research and experience, the construction of vernacular ideas of the political usually involve more eclectic patterns of borrowing, collage, and rapid cycling of thinkers and ideas in and out of the rosters and toolboxes of practical people. That's not to say that these thinkers and ideas are irrelevant to the people who look to them, just that they're relevant in a different way. Part 4, The Generation X Structure of Feeling Beyond finally stepping a foot into the concrete history of Generation X, I want to get a point across here by relating a high-level overview of the sordid story of the Strauss-Howe generational theory and its uses. That the structure of feeling that is any generation, and certainly Generation X, is constructed by people, not according to some master plan, but through the push and pull of numerous actors making use of the found parts left them by history. I tend to see the dimensions and dynamics of this space, the architecture of the structure of feeling, what communications it amplifies, multiplies, muffles, disallows, garbles, as being made up of numerous switches and spectra between discursive points, answers to questions and postures relative to concepts, that actors in the space can switch between or slide along the spectra amongst, depending on whether we see a given discursive line as binary or spectral. The lines or other shapes created by these interacting dimensions point in assorted directions, though I would say that in most generational discourse, and in Gen X discourse more than most, most lines of discourse point to one of two spaces, or both of them simultaneously, to each other and to success in the market. I think this is one reason a vernacular approach to intellectual history ought to be distinguished from a standard sacral approach. The standard approach tends to assume that the lines of discourse tend to run towards some standard point, upward, generally, towards greater and more universal truth, however conceived. For the most part, we are not looking at such arrangements here. I'm sure people with better senses of physical space than I have, which is to say most people, could come up with more and better metaphors here, but these should suffice for now. Whether we imbue it with the intention of the censor, or the innocence of the cinematographer, the sum of the lines and shapes that go into a structure of feeling include some things and necessarily exclude others. At whatever level of intent, actors in the space will make use of these exclusions and inclusions, modifying them as possible or as they see fit, or otherwise making use of what they find. This is one of the key entryways through which misprision makes itself known in the space of intellectual history. A simple lie, saying I have 11 fingers when I have 10, is the least interesting form of misprision for our purposes. What I want to explore is ways that users of a structure of feeling can make use of the structure to communicate with something other than an intention to arrive at truth, or even how they can shape structures of feeling to encourage their misprision of choice. In a time of surplus, it seems logical to think that misprision would often make use of surplus materials. As numerous observers of the late 20th century have informed us, it was indeed an age of surplus. Not just surplus money and consumer goods, but surplus ideas, surplus images, surplus art, surplus discourse, surplus purveyors of all of these things. So, a lot of the misprision we see in Generation X discourse involves substitutions, making use of the many available cultural materials to efface, distract, or obfuscate. Two types of this operation I want to highlight are simple substitutions as obfuscations and somewhat more sophisticated mimicry substitutions. It's possible to use one cultural material to obfuscate, crowd out, or demote another, a narrative, movement, or artifact that actors in the cultural space would prefer not to interact with in favor of something else. It's also possible to mimic a given cultural artifact to deliver part of whatever message an original concept was supposed to convey but not all of it, or with extra appendages not in the original. We're not talking about X because we're so busy talking about Y is an unfortunate reflexive trope of contemporary, often internet-based, discourse. But cliches come from somewhere. I think that the ways in which the constructors of the Gen X structure of feeling came to place grunge at the center of the cultural conversation they were having with themselves served, above all else, as an obfuscation. Namely, grunge discourse is an obfuscation of what turned out to be the more long-lasting trend in music and youth culture, the rise of hip-hop. It's not like commentators then or now pretended hip-hop didn't exist, and most would have granted that it was important. 
but we still see Kurt Cobain, Eddie Vedder, and the rest as generational voices, in a way that we don't see Tupac Shakur, Biggie Smalls, Nas, or dozens of other epoch-defining rappers. In a way not too dissimilar to how Obama became a cultural touchstone, you could say that Jay-Z and Beyoncé did at around the same time Obama rose to prominence, but less for their artistic merits and more as aspirational figures, the first hip-hop billionaires. All of these figures are big deals, born as part of Generation X, but they're not big Gen X deals, if that makes sense. There's a lot of reasons this could be. Racism almost certainly plays a part, as does the evident desire of music critics to establish a clear line of transmission from the rock music that defined their generation to something similar, something prominently featuring guitars and existentialism in the one upcoming. See what I said about baby boomers defining a lot of what Gen X was supposed to be about. I think, especially given the ways in which the conversation about music and the conversation about broader social trends were intertwined at the time, arguably more so with less ironic distance than they are today, that it makes some sense to argue that what grunge was meant to represent acted to obfuscate what hip-hop was meant to represent in a broader social-cultural sense. Hip-hop, for all the nihilism and things like gangster rap, is vibrant music coming out of a culture that saw hopes raised and then brutally dashed within the lifetimes of many of the people who brought it to mass popularity. It's not just the immiseration, the crack trade, and the gang wars, the mass incarceration and abandonment of black and brown communities by the rest of society that informs this music. It's the previous generation of hope and accomplishment whose music provided many of the hooks and samples that hip-hop uses so well that provide much of the historical piquancy of hip-hop. Hip-hop was a record of a people who had experienced defeat and lived with its circumstances and still lived to tell the tale. That, of course, is not to say that grunge was happy, hopeful music, as anyone who has ever listened to it could attest. But the focus was different. Kurt Cobain and other grunge heroes often enough came from families buffeted by the receding economic tides of neoliberalism, and grunge rose to prominence during the early 90s recession. Still, the focus of grunge music, and much of the culture we think of as specifically Gen X culture, that which is most commonly spoken through the communication medium we can call the Gen X structure of feeling, understood the defeat and decay of the times as essentially personal, a matter of individual and familial circumstance. It's not that grunge thought society was fair. Rather, grunge's concept of society essentially reflected a dark and irrational view of the individual. And so we see an essentially individualist and a historical concept of the decay of the end of the 20th century occlude one considerably more rooted in the realities of the moment. You see this pattern in many, many places in Gen X discourse, both the discourse of who Gen X is and what characterizes them, and in the discourse generated, sometimes to this day, by members, self-identified or not, of that cohort. I think it is sufficiently prevalent that we can call it a basic element of the Gen X structure of feeling. I've used physical metaphors to explain what is actually in a structure of feeling elsewhere in this lecture, so I suppose doing so again might help. I've used the metaphor of occultation, of something covering something else from view. I use occultation rather than other simpler words, hide, conceal, mask, etc., because coming from astronomy, where celestial bodies are said to occlude each other from observation, occultation does not imply intent or a plan. I don't think the occlusions in the cultural space of Generation X were the work of some conspiracy or master plan of grunge acts, social scientists, and journalists meeting up in secret to make sure that hip-hop didn't get its due or something. But I do think that many of these occlusions, as though they were reacting to the same gravitational pull, work to obscure the possibilities of collective power, of meaningful historical change, of the idea there is some vitality outside of the ruts in which the culture seems to have landed. Occlusion is one metaphor, mimicry is another. Here, intent is unavoidable. Why does something mimic something else? Generally, to fit into a niche where otherwise the mimic might be unwelcome. As it turned out, there were few time periods with more vacant cultural niches than the end of the 20th century. We sometimes talk about the 90s as a time of triumphant neoliberal capitalism. But some people clearly felt pretty pleased about the state of affairs. But clearly, a lot of people didn't. And it wasn't just depressed grunge rockers, alienated slackers, and rioting inhabitants of Los Angeles either. 
a cultural ar artifact often conjured to summon the supposedly triumphant mood of the times is Francis Fukuyama's The End of History and the Last Man. That book does indeed proclaim that liberal democratic capitalism, as represented by the United States, had ended the cycle of ideological conflict and with it, capital H history, the way that Hegel and philosophers who followed from him, like Fukuyama, understood it. But the tone of the book is not the sort of end zone dance you might expect. You get that from Tom Friedman and other writers of the period, but not from Fukuyama. Fukuyama, a neoconservative, was pleased by the fall of state communism, but was actually a little bummed out by what he saw around him. Without ideological conflict, what would give society meaning? He foresaw life in the West as a reshuffling of exhibits in the museum of its glorious past. In a very odd passage, he praised the street gangs of Los Angeles, the Crips and the Bloods, as representing the man motivated by timos, of pride and honor, as conceived of by the Homeric Greeks, the sort of man you weren't going to get much of anymore, according to him. That strangely autumnal mood of a triumph that isn't triumphant stalks the culture of the 90s. So too do strange growths across the cultural horizon. Grunge made a certain degree of sense as a terminal point for rock and roll. I would ascribe a certain fixation one sees in Gen X culture on high school with an attendant idea that adult life is basically high school, but sadder and with more pretensions, fits into this pattern as well. But there were other, less gainly cultural forms developing as Gen X reached maturity, and I think they owe some of their strangeness to the ways in which they came to fruition in this sort of historical nether zone. Whether or not the parties involved agreed with Fukuyama or even knew who he was, by and by cultural actors came to fill the niches vacated by the actors in the grand drama upon which Fukuyama thought he had seen the curtain fall. Whatever else it is, the aforementioned strauss howe generational theory, with all of its grandiosity, is a sort of mimic, somewhere between an off-brand imitator and a methadone substitute, for the kind of social theory that might produce rigorous, challenging, or simply coherent ideas. Generational theory was hardly alone in playing this role. I'm unwilling to turn this essay into an effort to adjudicate the theory wars of the late 20th century. But whatever one wants to say about the potentials of the theoretical interventions of this period emerging from the academy, the debates themselves over things like post-structuralism and post-modernism, especially when they spilled outside of the little hobbit village of academia, provided a sort of mimic substitute for the more thoroughgoing, mass-based radicalism of times both before and after. These things filled niches, clearly, despite the advertised deaths of meta-narratives like dialectical materialism, someone still wanted grand theories of history, and Strauss and Howe could sell you their birth order astrology. Fukuyama might have thought the conflicts over ideas that characterize modern history were over, but you could still make a living writing op-eds about what was going on on campus. Few of these ideas were truly new. They were mostly third-string liberal ideas, products of the fecund frenzy of 20th century liberals, to make up ways to understand history and society that kept them off the grounds of the left or sometimes the right. The late 20th century was their time to shine. One deviation from that pattern among the mimic niche fillers is what we see in terms of an artistic avant-garde in this period. The idea that art had a front at which the avant-garde could be implied it had a direction, that it was going somewhere. Even if a given artistic avant-garde insisted the direction of their art had nothing to do with politics, it usually at least implied some sort of challenge to the status quo. Human history is full of subcultures of artistically inclined people living differently from those around them. But for most of history, these subcultures were not understood by themselves or by those around them as challenging established hierarchies, either of power or of cultural values. If anything, artistic subcultures were usually quite close to power. That's where the money came from, after all, and usually the people with taste, too. An avant-garde that does challenge these things is an artifact of modernity, the period of change and ideological strife whose passing Fukuyama marked. So, what would avant-garde mean in a historical period where there was no more front to the process of history? Where either it had got where it was going or it never existed in the first place? Well, that turned out to be pretty simple. You just sort of swan about in similar ways to how early or avant-garde, surrealists and Dada, abstract expressionists and futurists, so on and so on, did, and let cultural presentation of self do the work for you. When I say this, I mean it less as a judgment on the talent or acumen of artists of the last quarter of the 20th century, though in the one area where I have much ability to judge, literature, they really didn't amount to much, and more on the claims made for their work to be something really new and revolutionary.
Most participants in these avant-gardes would gladly admit that all of them were just shuffling ingredients that came from before, most usually well within living memory. Even if you would argue that the original literary modernists, or the surrealists, or the futurists, or whoever else a 90s artist could model themselves after were doing the same thing, the originals probably would not have admitted to it. If I'm being honest, the plastic visual arts of this period seem like nothing so much as a set of bad pranks elevated to a sort of vitiated pseudo-religious importance by truly bored rich people and those who cater to them. But I will, I will admit, I don't know painting, sculpture, etc. very well. I do know prose writing a little bit better, so to illustrate this dynamic I will use the example of the literary brat pack that came to some prominence in the mid-1980s, some members of which are still prominent in literature today. Of course, no one described as being part of the literary brat pack liked that term themselves, insisted they just hung out a few times, that it wasn't a real literary movement, etc. You don't need to know much about art history to know that most movements either insist on their own non-existence or else act like something between a small political party and a cult, complete with excommunications, and the former is a lot easier. Among the most insistent of the brat packers with regards to the non-existence of the pack as a unitary body, was Brett Easton Ellis, the member of the group whose literary career has lasted the longest. You don't hear much from Jay McInerney or Tama Janowitz these days. Ellis was anointed a, a, an important new literary voice on the strength of his 1985 debut novel, Less Than Zero, a tale of nihilist teens in Los Angeles that Ellis started writing when he was, well, a nihilist teen in Los Angeles. It's remarkable to think that in the 80s, gossip sections and tabloids would dedicate space to writers, just as writers, not as writers who are, say, dating a more famous person. I have been assured by fans of gossip blogs that this doesn't generally happen anymore, which is interesting when you consider that the content mill presumably demands more grist. But back in the 80s, Ellis and company made it on there sometimes, partying and posturing with a certain jaded beyond their years looseness. While Less Than Zero, with its child sex slaves and implications that rich L.A. kids had the life expectancy of then-starving Ethiopian children, as a friend of mine liked to put it, is a little more extreme than comparable works, the work of the literary Brat Pack shared many characteristics. All of the protagonists were contemporary young adults, usually about the same age and the same gender as a given writer. All of the prose was studiedly flat, all had a general tone of decadence and doom. Fukuyama probably would have chewed his own arm off rather than depict some of the things Ellis has his characters casually observe, but both saw this end of history period as, at the very least, sad and somewhat bereft. There were two reference points for the packaging of the literary bat brat pack by the publishing industry. One was, obviously, the Hollywood brat pack, young stars like Charlie Sheen, who became tabloid favorites at around the same time. But the other was the so-called Lost Generation writers of the period immediately following World War I. Youth without moorings, writing minimalist prose about dark and traumatic things, imbued with that Hemingway Fitzgerald glamour. You can see why publicists would want to run with that, and they did. Not just for the actual social circle around Ellis and McInerney, but for Ellis's Bennington classmate Donna Tart when she came out with The Secret History, well after the shine had started to come off for most of the crowd. References to the 20s were a gift that kept on giving, at least until readers of literary fiction gave up on caring about that kind of thing altogether. Here's the funny thing with that. None of the Brat Pack writers read very much like Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Elliot, or Stein. And they don't really claim them as influences either, as I've seen. Brett Easton Ellis worships at the Temple of Joan Didion. McInerney was basically doing waspy disillusion and divorce. Think Louis Auchincloss with the volume turned up. Donna Tart cited influences from seemingly everywhere, Evelyn Waugh, classical drama, southern gothic writing, horror paperbacks, other than the literary modernism that the lost generation ushered into American consciousness. And what exactly did any of the literary Brat Pack lose? In their fiction, their sense of loss typically stems from being raised fecklessly, usually in comfortable circumstances, in general post-adolescent ennui. They did not see a catastrophe like the First World War. Most of them did not claim to, so they are not entirely to blame, whatever one may think of gadflies like Ellis, for the impression that all it took to be considered avant-garde after the late 70s or so was to look bored and disaffected and have a good publicist. That's before even getting into how an avant-garde based on an earlier avant-garde would even make sense in geometric terms, if nothing else. So why did anyone bother? Here it's worth noting that the Gen X age cohort 
may have been the first to come to adulthood after the establishment of vertically and horizontally integrated corporate media. I'm well aware that prior generations of artists, like the rock stars of old and the jazz singers before them, had to struggle with the money game in their respective fields. What I am saying is that what we see emerge in the 70s are considerably more consolidated, professional, and just bigger and more powerful media conglomerates. These had a more rational approach to turning culture into profit than such actors as, say, Elvis's Colonel Parker. That's not to say that the Colonel was not interested in profit, just that he could not pursue it in the way modern record labels, movie studios, and publishers could and can. So the likes of Ellis and all, Cobain too for that matter, and the Gen X filmmakers, Linklater, Tarantino, and so on, were put through a considerably more advanced image-making machine than earlier generations of artists. It must have been a simple answer for publicists. A bit of glamour, a bit of terseness, a bit of transgression, and a lot of appeal to the distinctly limited historical reference base of the late 20th century reading public, and voila, we have a new lost generation. Never mind the context, never mind the actual texts and how they don't fit. Part 5 of Flat Worlds, Edges, and End Times. It is important we don't let our discussion of forms, the shapes of cultural operations within the structure of feeling of Generation X, lead us into a sterile formalism. Context and content still matter and interact with each other and with patterns of form, with the patterns of form we have laid out in many fold complex ways. The forms are complex, not the way I've laid them out. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to make these discussions brief, more of a sketch. I tried to sketch the formal discussion above too, but I think at that level of abstraction I needed to expand on things to make them clear. I think to serve as this lecture intends to, we need to bring up some of the elements one has a right to expect when discussing the intellectual history of Generation X and the context that helps define and contain their formal relationships. Maybe because I'm used to sharing my ideas in spaces like these birthday lectures and social media, I tend to expect more immediate reaction to the things I say than most academics do, and I expect that reaction to be blunter and less guarded by convention. So whenever I make a generalization about a time period, I am prepared to hear a what about. While sometimes frustrating, I actually think this has been helpful. If I say high end of history period from the decade, the decade from the fall of the Soviet Union to 9-11 was a time of feelings of decay and defeat, there are obvious counterpoints. There's the capitalist ecstasy of the profits of globalization and the early World Wide Web, the idea of a triumphant Pax Americana that would spread peace and prosperity the world over, it's the idea of liberation from old deadly conflicts between nations and ideologies, etc., and from cultural hierarchies as pop culture advanced across the globe and into acceptance as important art, so on and so on. It doesn't do to dismiss these as irrelevant. It might be appropriate to bracket them on the idea that any given study needs to limit itself. But I do see myself as trying to create a prologue to a study of this period and the generation that came to maturity in it, an Anglophone culture as a whole, so that bracketing maneuver would be something of a cop-out. Instead, consider the two emotional registers at either end, say, the apocalypticism of a Kathy Acker, or the despair of a Kurt Cobain on one side, and the ecstasy of a Tom Friedman or some of the early cyber culture enthusiasts as the other, as poles, points that circumscribe a space. Effectively, these poles may be opposites, but between them they cooperate to define what is in, and crucially, what is outside of a given space. The peculiar versions of both pessimism and optimism we see in this structure of feeling aren't the only polar dyads in this space, but they seem to be an important one. Consider what they exclude, agency, especially co collective agency. The pessimism of grunge culture, the sense of exhaustion barely masked by giddy theoretical excesses in most academic fields, the cynicism in the arts from literary brat pack sneering to the increasingly obvious prankish pointlessness of much of the plastic arts, the elegiac wistfulness you find in Fukuyama and many of the other boosters of the Pax Americana. None of these promise the ability of people to do great things, to change the reality in which they live, and promise even less for the possibilities of collective power to change. Where there was such a thing as change, it was individual, or at best familial, often enough in the context of chosen family. You and your buddies could joke away the collapse of meaning, away from your feckless and or abusive actual family and community ties, in the Palm Springs desert, around the gated, faded glamour of the 20th century, 
like the protagonists in the Doug Copeland novel that helped give Generation X its name. This, or the promise of fuck you money by getting in early on an internet startup, or learning the supreme mathematics of the five percenters, which hip-hop artists such as the Wu-Tang Clan saw as key to a stoic acceptance of the nature of the universe, was a liberation on offer. And things weren't much better as far as the optimists were concerned, except that they thought no one could possibly need or want the power to change, perhaps beyond the wisdom to see their situation as already optimal. To stop asking, who moved my cheese, as a business bestseller of the time put it, and simply follow the cheese wherever the cheese chooses to go. The world is flat, as Tom Friedman put it at the time from the editorial page of the New York Times. He's still there, folks. And from the title of one of his several bestsellers that attempted to explain our brave new post-Cold War globalized world. The literary figures we've discussed, Brat Pack members like Brett Easton Ellis, accidental generation namer Douglas Coupland, would likely want little to do with Friedman, his exuberant, emotive, disorganized writing, or his optimism. But it would be hard for them to disagree with the central premise as far as their writing is concerned. Their worlds, too, were flat and described in fittingly flat language. And they were as impossible to escape as Friedman thought his version of liberal democratic capitalist globalization was. He referred to it as the golden straitjacket, and everyone would soon be wearing it. So it was in Gen X literature. If you escaped from Ellis's world of emotional deadness, commodity fetishism, and just regular old fetishism, you ceased to exist as far as he was concerned. His worlds are as hermetically sealed as any secondary world fantasy, more so, arguably, given the relatively small number of real-world influences that have any bearing on the creation of Ellis Land, especially compared to the wider basis of reference from history and mythology from which fantasists generally draw. If you read any of Ellis's nonfiction, you'll see how his cool vanishes as soon as he's expected, even momentarily, to acknowledge the existence of people outside of his chosen realm of the affectless rich. Doug Coupland's blithe Gen Xers, for their part, could see, would see anything outside of their ambit as trivia, a genocide just as much as an old movie star's sexual peccadilloes, all facts with more or less piquancy, to catch and launch at each other like so many conversational pokeballs. If the world is flat, where else to go but the edge? I did not have time or space to do the, do the history that the concept of edginess deserves in this lecture. From what I can glean, it seems like the concept of edginess, to the extent it was ever meant sincerely, came to the fore once it became good and certain that any counterculture could and would get appropriated by mass culture packaged up and sold. The only debate would be whether this was a tragedy or whether every given counterculture was always already a consumer product, as Thomas Frank argued at the time. So, edginess could be a few things. It could be the desperate lunge for a frontier, where you'd have to pick up sticks and leave every few years as the culture took what had once been edgy and defanged it, like how some American frontiersmen supposedly used to light out a few hundred miles further west whenever they could hear neighbors. Or it could be a kind of catch-all, a ridicule, where assorted off-brand ideas, aesthetics, cultural political movements could be placed in arrays that seem baffling now. Take a gander through the Apocalypse Culture or Gone to Croatoan collections, sold through alternative bookstores or mail-order catalogs at the time, or cast your mind back to the internet before contemporary social media did its thing. In certain respects, the grab bags of ideas, conspiracy theory next to social theory, Nazis next to communists and anarchists, extreme genres of music, obsessions with cults, killers, UFOs, reinterpretations of history and cosmology, you see in these spaces were more the result of low editorial standards than any intentional strategy. But you could argue that low editorial standards was a key part of the worldview of 90s edginess culture. That is precisely that that allows for freedom and flourishing of expression, whatever its implications may be socially or politically, as far as the edgy were concerned. Anti-globalization thought and activism lingered, all too long, possibly fatally long, in the edginess space, but this was still very much a cultural formation for the flat world Friedman proclaimed. As aging Gen Xer Jez from the British sitcom Peep Show put it, when calling a Nazi on his racism would momentarily inconvenience him, aren't we supposed to be living in a multicultural democracy? And isn't that the point? You know, the Jews, the Muslims, and the racists all living together happily side by side, doing and saying whatever the hell they like. 
And here's where I want to give something of a fillip to my readers and listeners, most of them, like me, millennials, from the generation that came after Gen X. We have, supposedly, the smarter millennials anyway, left behind edginess culture, the idea that the world is flat and that difference is just so many meaningless aesthetic markers that carry with them no historical or political charge. For their part, it seems that Gen Xers, as a cohort, have clung less to a generational identity than have baby boomers, which I think is an admirable decision. But many Gen Xers who have decided to lean on their age cohort as part of their presentation of self have done so specifically in studied contrast to what they see as the failings of millennials. This mostly has to do with our supposed moralism, with which we dispatched the edginess culture, and who knows what else, chain restaurants, engagement rings, etc., etc., a number of prominent contemporary crusaders against woke culture, ranging from Matt Taibbi to Megan Daum to Wesley Yang to Thomas Chatterton Williams to Brett Easton Ellis to, on the extreme end of things, Gavin McGinnis, all either cite their generational identity or, much the same thing, the specific times and circumstances in which they came to maturity as a mark of superiority to millennials, one of the things that elevates them above woke moralism. You would figure that they... The fact that they literally had no say over what year they were born might inculcate a certain modesty about this accomplishment, and yet. Even if you don't subscribe to the sort of cultural revolution theory of wokeness impl implicit in the more grandiose anti-woke worldviews, I do think that the structure of feeling that has grown up since the second decade of the 21st century has some pretty substantial differences from the one that Gen X made and or had handed to it by its elders. Using the sort of spatial metaphors we were using before, a lot of valuations within the space got rearranged. It would be hard to think why they wouldn't, over the passage of time and the many important events, technical and economic changes, etc. A lot of matters the Gen, X under, Gen Xers understood as switches came to become spectras, gender being the most notable, the various things that Gen Xers typically understood to be spectra tended to get simplified into something more like switches, the distinction between ideas and actions that are and aren't acceptable stands out. The Gen X critics aren't just being dramatic when they say they can't speak anymore even though they continue to palaver. Structures of feeling are a communication medium, and the structure of feeling of my generation is different enough that a lot of what they try to say doesn't really translate. These differences are real and relevant, but I would put it to the reader, mostly from my generation, but it might be relevant to those who come before and come after as well, that things have not changed as much as they appear to have done. To me, the single greatest piece of evidence for this is the stuckness of culture, especially in prose literature. I said a few, fair few negative things about Gen X writers, I have plenty more to say, I didn't even really get into David Foster Wallace here for other occasions. But with all the differences and ideas between millennials and Xers, for all the manifold changes in technology that you'd figure would allow for new voices to come forward, it's impossible to say much more for millennial literature now that the oldest of the generation approaches their 40s than you can for Gen X. There's still the same failures of nerve and imagination, the same promotion of mediocrity, this time more from insisting writers engage with social media than getting writers onto the pages of tabloids, the same sense of exhaustion as we try to pick out a good standard bearer. Even the better candidates, your Sally Rooney's or whoever, exude fatigue. This is remarkable when you think about it. We've witnessed history, proclaimed over in our lifetime, come roaring back to life. We have this undeniable sword of Damocles dangling over our collective heads in the form of climate change and attendant disasters. We've seen real changes in how many people think about many basic ideas, about gender and race, about love, about the future. We have the opportunity that comes to every generation with the changing of the times. And yet, and yet, we replicate the same navel-gazing, the same sterile aping of either early 20th century modernism or later postmodernism dressed up as avant-garde, the same limits on the imagination that made Gen X literature such a wasteland. To me, the lesson is clear. We make a culture, but we do not make it just as we please. The Gen Xers understood themselves as living in a sort of imaginary Alexandria of heterodoxy and freedom, some of them, which some of them see as having been done in by the Jerusalem of millennial moral fanaticism and the Rome of power-mad boomer revanchism. But here's the deal. All those cities were in the same damn empire, often enough not even really supervised that closely by the notional capital, 
Above all, inhabitants of all of them, and of the Babylon one is tempted to consign this whole period of history to, all of them wipe their asses with a sponge on a stick kept in a pot of vinegar, if they were lucky, and a third of their kids died before they were five. My point is, we cannot break through the limits of our collect on our collective imaginations, because they are, in part, material. They are material in many ways, from the ways in which it is increasingly difficult for a working person to get their foot in the door of culture to the near-instant co-optation of counterculture or oppositional culture. Numerous material factors, from the price of rent to the construction of the carceral state, have helped keep us where we are. If you want a real irony, consider the sort of feckless idealism that animates much of both Gen X and millennial literature and the massive weight of materiality behind that enforced sense of nothing truly mattering, that commonality between our respective structures of feeling that make the concept of material change directed by human beings so difficult to meaningfully communicate. Well, at the end of the day, imagination translates to reality with a stake of a, of a claim. I believe something, and I'm willing to risk something based on said belief. I said earlier that vernacular discourse points in many directions, whereas sacred discourse points upward. However, upward is conceived in a given culture towards the universal. Were I to point upward here, it would be that as long as we live with the paradox of infinite imagination and distinctly finite physical reality, the staking of a claim, of risking what is finite to gain something we can only imagine, is always an option open to us. Vast arrays of cultural formations, many which have survived the decades from Gen X coming up during the end of history to our own period of history's return, exist to convince us to not state claims, or to pretend to do so while not do doing so at all. But it seems as though some people, somewhere, are going to anyway, despite how late the hour is getting. The owl of Minerva takes wing at dusk. Let's fly.